Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Uh, my name is Richard Holloway, and it's my privilege and indeed my pleasure to chair this session. It's sponsored by the Thomas Miller Investment Trust, whose office is here in Charlotte Square, and we are deeply grateful to them for their continuing sponsorship of the festival. Our distinguished guest <coughs> is Richard Coles. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. <Sorry>. Um, <laughs> He's the presenter of Saturday Live on BBC's Radio 4, and he's the author of the memoir with this uh, tepid little cover, um, <laughs> Fathomless Riches, or How I Went from Pop to Pulpit. Um, Richard is a multi-instrument musician, and the pop group of his title was The Communards, which had a number one hit, Don't Leave Me Now, and was the biggest selling single in 1986. <laughs> The pulpit he presently occupies is in Findon, is that how you pronounce it? It's down in England, so I can't get the pronunciation <laughs> right. Um, it's, um, it's in North Northamptonshire. Uh, his memoir is the account of how he got uh, from uh, pop to pulpit. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to have him here, so please welcome Richard Coles to the Edinburgh Book Festival. Thank you very much. Richard, one catty reviewer uh, described your book as being like an old Spanish fiddleback chasuble encrusted with sparklers and glitter balls. Now, this is Presbyterian Edinburgh. We don't get that <laughs> stuff. Well, what, what could he possibly have meant? Well, I think that is the Right Honourable Chris Bryant MP writing in The Guardian. Chris Bryant was actually a priest of the Church of England before he went on to uh, lesser things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think he was referring to uh, a shared experience we had which would be perhaps familiar to you, if not uh, to most of Presbyterian Scotland, which is of that Anglo-Catholic uh, kind of golden fire that burns in certain places in the Church of England and indeed the Anglican Communion. Uh, a Church of England which on the one hand uh, is confident in its Reformation identity, but on the other hand seeks to reconnect to its Catholic past. The Church of England as personality disorder, you might call it, <laughs> which is the Church of England in which I find myself most at home. Go figure. Uh, but there is something about that, uh, a certain sensibility which you would find in that very flamboyant, very dressy end of the Church of England, much concerned with the cut of your chasuble and the silk of your vimper. <laughs> Glossary available, folks, if you need it. <laughs> but at the same time, is allied to a very particularly Anglican theological vision and also a commitment to uh, a social gospel, a commitment to change in the world uh, that was very powerful in its time, or perhaps mm -hmm. less powerful now. Yeah, yeah. But that's where I think I'm most at home. Yep, yeah, good place to be. Um, there's a lovely wee story in the book about um, a new curate appearing at St. Albans Holborn uh, and one of the... Uh, you, you repeat the story well, to give about you his of, cart up. I was just trying to explain the sort of culture of St. Albans Holborn, which is one of the great Anglo-Catholic shrines <coughs> in London where I sort of came to, to faith. And uh, it was notorious for having... The vestry was bigger than the church. It was that sort of a place. <laughs> And uh, there, were, there was a, a whole kind of battalion of servers, 12 torch, torch bearers, thurifers, crucifers, all that kind of thing. And a new curate arrived one day, rather nervously put on his new cotter, which is a particular kind of little surplus, and came into the sanctuary and stood there looking pious. And I remember one server turned to another and went, five pleats. <laughs> <laughs> It says it all. <laughs> <laughs> now, Richard, you're posh, but you're not that posh. No. Um, and, uh, but, but I don't normally enjoy the ancestral bits in, in biographies, but I did enjoy the bits in this book. Tell us about your family. I mean, it wasn't Brideshead, it was Barrett's. I mean, t tell us... Well, it was. Tell us about, yeah. It was literally, literally Barrett's, yeah. 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 Well, I, I come from Northamptonshire, where I am now, and I was the son of a shoe manufacturer who was the son of a shoe manufacturer who was the son of a shoe manufacturer. And uh, d we trace our sort of distinction, such as it was, back to a great-great-great-grandfather who was a silk weaver turned clockmaker. 
And those two attributes came together, and he invented machinery when the mechanization of shoemaking came along. Northamptonshire, of course, a great center in England for shoe manufacturing. And that kind of raised the Coleses above the throng. And the First World War greatly enriched my great-grandfather. The Second World War greatly enriched my grandfather. My father, unfortunately, lived in a time of peace and, um, <laughs> and did not enjoy the dividend that mm. world conflicts can bring. But I must tell you that the, the place I, I'm vicar now, we used to own the factory in the, in the town where I'm vicar now, and some of the older people there remembered my, used to work for my father and my grandfather. And I went to see one of the older ladies who's, who's housebound, and I was talking to her. And I said, this will just give you an idea about the kind of culture. And I said, uh, what did you do in work? And she said, oh, I worked in the shoe trade. And I said, oh, really, what did you do? And she said, well, I was personal secretary to a shoe manufacturer in the great days of the uh, 50s and 60s. And I said, oh, what was that like? And she said, well, basically, it was my job to keep his mistresses and his wife separate. <laughs> And I said, oh, yes. And then as the conversation developed, I realized she was talking about my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and were you aware of that um, interesting side to him? Not at the time. He was a very flamboyant person. Yeah. And to him, I owe my love of music. He was a great... I mean, I realize now he was Mr. Toad. But at the time, I thought he was this incredibly glamorous figure. He used to wear plus fours. and He had a waxed mustache. And he played the piano. And he used to do Stanley Holloway songs, Sam, Sam, pick up that musket, with incredibly rude words of his own <laughs> devising, now I realize. Yeah. But he was a larger-than-life character. And I adored him. Yeah. And uh, I think that sort of my weakness for... Uh, playing the piano and certainly for showing off and also perhaps for the f uh, pleasures and finer things of life come from him. You seem to have the gift to pick up any musical instrument and be able to play it almost immediately. I mean, did you know that as a wee boy or did it... I think it'd be fair to say I could pick up any musical instrument and make people wish I'd put it down again <laughs> almost immediately. I mean, I, I started very early on the piano. I was yeah. influenced by my grandfather, so I started piano lessons when I was four. And the advantage of that is, is that you get a good couple of, years, couple of years of solid grounding before you really know what a chore is. Mm -hmm. So I was mm -hmm. playing reasonably well by the age of eight. And then I took up the fiddle, which I loved. But I have to say, I mean, it was a typical, as, uh, when I was writing the memoir, I re remembered an episode when we had a nice gardener called Mr. Wattam, who was charming. And uh, for some reason, I wanted to impress him. And I was um, in my bedroom, which overlooked the back garden. He was working in the back garden. And I took my violin, and I put on a record of the Bach Partita in D minor. <laughs> and then I stood in the window going... <laughs> so while Mr. Wattam, who seemed completely unbothered by my musical virtuosity, might not have been moved by it, anybody else who was, was it was entirely for fraudulent reasons. And I've, I managed to make um, a little ability go a very long way in music and indeed in so many things. <laughs> have you ever tried the bagpipes? Actually, I have, yes. And uh, I, in fact, I, I could see you, actually. I could see you kind of pumping away there. Well, I went to the bagpipe competition at the Argyle Gathering oh, one year, right. which was, of yeah. course, full of Canadians, yeah. oddly. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was very much... Well, I think the Highland pipes would be a bit loud for me. I think mm. Lowland pipes yeah. would be good. I do the, and you love Scotland anyway, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I've... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do my. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've s I spend a lot of my time here, and uh, many of my friends are here. And I'm happier in Scotland, I think, than almost anywhere else. And I very much would like to live here one day. Oh, come on, we, we can organise that very easily. <laughs> well, I have um, I have some work to do to finish off where I am at the moment. But I would very I could very happily. I mean. I'm just, we go every year to Kintyre. In fact, yeah. we're going in a couple of weeks up to Kintyre yeah, yeah. and stay in the same place. And if I could live in Kintyre with a helicopter <laughs> and Mediterranean weather. <laughs> <laughs> and you just met the First Minister and had a picture taken with her, which is yes. now in your eyes. I mean, she begged me for my counsel. Yeah, of course she did. <laughs> <laughs> Who can blame her? Yeah, I asked yeah. her just if she'd come down and sort out the British Labour Party, but she pulled her face at that. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even she could do that. I think. But, um, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> One of the, yeah, well, well, well let, let's move on. <laughs> let's let's um, jump to the communards, uh. Uh, and that hit, and where it led you all. And tell us all, tell us about all those years, and about Jimmy Somerville and your relationship with him, and, and how it is with between the two of you now. Well, um, 
Yes. Uh, well, uh, it sort of started... I uh, grew up in Northamptonshire. I went to a, a minor public school and did minor public school sort of things until teenagehood came along. And then when I was a teenager, I realised I was gay. And with that realisation came simultaneously the idea that probably Kettering was not going to be where my future <laughs> was going to happen. There was a hair salon in Montague Place. <laughs> where, uh, <laughs> A certain liberal culture prevailed, but that yeah. was about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of, through a complicated uh, set of manoeuvres, escaped to London and arrived in London at the age of 18 in King's Cross. So naive. And, well, quite. King's Cross was quite a sort of seedy place in those oh, yeah. days. And um, yeah. I lived in a, I had a very uh, noise, a very unpleasant little flat at the bottom of the Caledonian Road. And I couldn't understand why all these ladies were waiting for a bus when there was no bus stop there. <laughs> But it was all right because men kept stopping to offer them lifts. <laughs> so, uh, so I hope they all got home safely. But, um, uh, <laughs> but it was, um, I was not really, I was really a very, you know, I was a good public school boy from provincial England. But there I bumped in at the same time. Another runaway, although in his case from Mary Hill in, in Glasgow in quite a tough life, was Jimmy Somerville, who had escaped also and arrived at Euston just down the road. He and his flatmate uh, lived in a squat just opposite the British Museum in the days when you could squat just opposite the British mm -hmm. Museum. And he and I sort of fell in with each other. We were both young gay men running around London at the same time. And uh, we started a group of us started a little club night on a Wednesday evening in a pub in Islington. And uh, a sociologist interviewed me recently and they said, what was it like being in at the beginning of the alternative gay movement? <laughs> I didn't know we were having an alternative <laughs> gay movement. But there was a group of people who later went on to achieve notoriety and even distinction in music and film. And uh, out of that, Bronsky Beat happened. And then uh, I was playing in another band. And Bronsky Beat, I mean, Jimmy Somerville sang, and all of a sudden the world realised a spectacular talent. He had one of those great pop voices, which uh, is so distinctive of its time and of its era, and also speaks of the experience of a group of people, not just of, of an individual. And anyone, I think, who'd run away to London for reasons of sexual orientation, or for any reason at all, had run away, mm. would recognise in the song Small Town Boy, which is Bronsky Beat's first song, mm. uh, an anthem for that. And so we threw in our lot together. It was our ambition to bring down Margaret Thatcher with pop music. <laughs> Where is she now? <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> I have to say that was rather an exalted ambition yeah. in the middle years of the 1980s. Mm. But uh, that we were very committed to... I mean, there's a film recently called Pride, you may have seen, about a group of lesbians and gay men who supported uh, a strike. The minor strike. The minor yeah. strike, yeah. which we were part of. And we, mm. So we had this extraordinary experience in the early 80s of being caught up in the very conflicted politics of that period. But there was this extraordinary measure of pop success at the same time. Mm. So we were literally flying hither and thither on Honcourt, uh, on Honcourt, on a um, <coughs> Concord, and then finding ourselves standing on a picket line the next day, going, "The Workers United will never be defeated. Where's my boarding pass?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> there was one great time when we were, we'd been in New York because we worked out there quite a lot, and we were asked to go to Paris to take part in a big benefit concert in aid of the uh, anti-racist movement, which was broadcast live to the French-speaking world. And the night before, they had a debate, the way French television likes to do, simultaneously translated. And me and Jimmy were there, and there was a bloke there who represented a, as a right-wing political party. He was very charming, but came from a different place. Is it a right-wing political party still in existence? I'm not sure, actually. No. I'm not sure. It's uh, all a bit mysterious. But anyway, yeah. they said to us, why are you here? And I said something about how important it was for us to express our solidarity with the... Uh, trade union, all that kind of thing. And then this bloke asked me a question of, don't you think it's a bit hypocritical being a pop star and getting involved in this stuff? And I said, no, because our lives aren't so different, really. The idea that just because we do what we do doesn't mean we can't identify and share the experience of people who struggle. And he said, I was sitting behind you on Concord last <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. Tell us how it kind of went wrong for you. It, it kind of brought... I mean, you always had a turbulent relationship with Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy was someone who... One of those people who had neutral 
and nuclear. There were two yeah, settings yeah. with him. It's a Scottish thing. Well, also yeah, he'd yeah. grown up. Mm -hmm. You know, he was mm -hmm. the he was the one gay kid or out gay kid growing up in Mary Hill in the nineteen oh, seventies. No. Yeah. I said, yeah, how yeah. did people know? Yeah. And he said he was the only boy who bunked off school to watch the Bay City Rollers open a carpet shop. Yeah. Which kind of gave yeah. it away. Yeah. But. But Jimmy, had his repertoire of, uh, his emotional repertoire was, was, was really quite um, vivid, if I can call it that way. And working together, because the great thing about me and Jimmy is we were so very different. And uh, gay identity often is a sort of commonwealth mm. for people who come mm. from very mm. different backgrounds and find shared experience. And when we wrote out of that, I think we were at our best. But also the fact that we were very different also fed uh, what... Uh, pulled us apart as well as drew us together. And uh, in the pressures of pop success, which are intense, although mm. you know, I wouldn't pretend that they, you know, no one would say no, or very few people would, but nonetheless, it's very intense. And the sort of fractures and flaws in our relationship became acute. And also, I was very conscious that I was a mediocre pianist and an even more mediocre Seriously, sax player. Seriously, I mean, are you? Are you yeah, you're not yeah I mean, uh, I, there are many, many people who could do what I do, but Jimmy Somerville mm. is a spectacularly gifted Mm. and distinctive and yeah. unique person. And to stand next to someone, your working partner and also your <laughs> close friend, uh, while they um, suck up the light in the air, deservedly, mm. Mm. you wither in that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I withered in that, especially someone who was rather self-seeking and, uh, you know, and attention-seeking myself. Mm. So that was tough. And then on top of that, the, in the middle of our greatest success, when we had you know, commercial success, which rewarded us handsomely, but also the vindication of being out gay men in a band, and that felt you know, that we were really pushing the boundaries of that. At exactly the time that happened, HIV and AIDS impacted Aunt our Ada, lives. Aunt Ada, you call it. Yeah. Auntie Ada came to yeah, call, as yeah, a friend yeah. said, yeah. Mm. So we were of that first generation of people who'd arrived in a big metropolitan centre, after the first gains of gay liberation had opened up yeah. space yeah. for fun and excitement and sexual mm. excess and experimentation, all the things that you love doing when you're young. More tea, Vicar? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but before that was closed down by the arrival of this, what felt like a medieval plague, yeah. this completely yeah. uh, unexpected visitor that arrived and, you know, we had friends who were in their fit and in their 20s who would develop a cough and within a week mm. would have been dead. I mean, I read accounts, I've been reading accounts recently of the Black Death. Yeah. And in lots yeah. of ways, yeah. it was... It was it you was write similar. very movingly about it, but there's a staggering bit in the book. Um, you've had an HIV test yeah. and it comes back negative and you're not thrilled. You're, you're unhappy about it. You want to be HIV positive. Tell us about that. I mean, is, is that really how you felt at the time? Well, it was, was extremely, it's not my finest hour at all, but I think there was this <coughs> period of uh, intense turbulence. Where on the one hand, yeah. enormous success, and on the other hand, the sort of catastrophe of AIDS. And in the middle of that, I got ill, I got shingles, mm. which actually was simply because I was uh, overdoing it. But shingles was... Uh, often an indicator of the uh, first collapse of the immune system, you see what mm. I mean. So I just assumed that I had, uh, was, I was going to be HIV positive, as lots of people around me were. And uh, Jimmy and I were in a particularly difficult time. We were on tour in Switzerland, and uh, we had a huge fight, I remember. And then I said that I was HIV positive. I thought I was, actually, but I think also, I, to be honest, I used it as a sort of get off my back, Mm. Uh, thing. Anyway, went back home, had the HIV test, and then of course it came back negative. So I then had to uh, deal with, of course, by then word had got out that I was HIV positive. There was a whole big drama about that. And a drama which, in, if I'm completely honest, I think I sort of got something out of too. Mm. Very difficult thing to admit. But then, of course, reality obliged me in the end to say, actually, I'm not HIV positive, mm. which wasn't uh, uniquely accepted with good grace, and rightly so. I mean, it's just extraordinary that there was someone like me who was sort of faking it, but there were lots of people for whom that was anything but mm, fake. Mm, mm. And, it was in the, and that was an experience of intense humiliation. And that, of course, was one of the triggers that I think started me, uh, began to get what I've described as religious twinges. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you had one of those religious um, kind of urges in St. Mary's Cathedral, our own cathedral in Palmerston Place at Evensong. Yes, um, that's true. The beginnings of a kind of spiritual stirrings. Tell us about that. 
Well, I crashed out of pop music, and I did what most pop stars do. I didn't want to disappoint anybody, so I crashed and burned, which is you know, what pop stars are required to do. And um, I had a year of basically taking lots of drugs and spending lots of money and behaving like an idiot, really, although it was good fun. Well, the first six months was good fun. At the end of that, I sort of crashed out of that and realized that I had to get a grip. And I was by now doing some stuff with the Edinburgh Festival, so I came up to this city. And I was on my own on a Sunday afternoon, and I walked past your cathedral mm -hmm. in Palmerston Place, and it was Evensong, and I sat at the back, and they sang Stanford in B-flat, yep. which was a piece that I sang myself. I was a chorus. Because you were a choir boy. boy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, in retrospect, I went in as a spectator, and I came out as a participant. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, mm. because that was funny. I got a letter yesterday from somebody who just read the book. It was a card, actually, of St. Mary's Palmerston Place, because he had just been and heard Walton's Magnificat the ah, previous Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a marker of uh, mm -hmm. a significant change. And then there was an extraordinary moment um, in St. Albans, Holborn. Um, and to get this, you really need to understand that this, this is probably the most advanced Anglo-Catholic parish church in London. I mean, it's so far up the candle, it's an outer space. <laughs> um, <coughs> and you went to high mass there, which was probably the Roman rite, because it was they, did, the Roman rite, they yeah. even disdained normal Anglican worship. Um, and you had what you call a kind of classical Protestant conversion experience in that context. Yeah. Now, John Knox would not have understood that. No. Um, so explain what you mean by that kind of um, polarity. Well, the, the, I mean, I found way. myself in, as you say, this absolute shrine of Catholic worship with incense and bells and choir and vestments and color and a completely full fat version of Catholic liturgy, fuller than you'd find in the Roman Catholic Church because it was the, the kind of Catholic culture that endured before the reforms yeah. of yeah. the Second Vatican Council. And there I sat there, but kind of wretchedly, full of a sense of my own um, uh, failings and circumstances. And there was an extraordinary moment when I didn't know what was going on. It had been so long since I'd been in church as anything other than a kind of hostile observer. That, um, but anyway, there was a moment when the priest lifted the consecrated host and the bell rang out and the puff of smoke came up from the censer. And I felt, it was the bell actually, that I was pierced to the soul and something within me broke mm -hmm. and I wept and I was hopeless. This poor man sitting next to me had no idea what to do with me. I was there in a puffer jacket and those very complicated trainers that we wore in those days. <coughs> there was some poor chap in a, in a sort of rather buttoned up tweed jacket, sports jacket. But anyway, <laughs> but, but what happened was, of course, and I realized, I recognized it from the great Wesley hymn, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the chains fell off and I was free and all of a sudden I felt the love and the light and the presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Not in the Eucharist, too theological, it wasn't that at all. I was hungry mm. and here was food. Yeah. There's a wonderful poem, George Herbert, where... Oh yes, love bad me welcome. Yes, mm. you must, it, well, it, yeah. where Jesus says to the hungry soul, mm. you must sit down and taste my meat. Yeah. And I did sit and, and eat. eat. Yeah. And that was it. I was yes. just hungry yeah. and here was yeah. food and I knew that my place was at that table mm -hmm. and I've never felt differently. Yeah. And then um, you decide to go off and study theology at King's College in London. Yes. Um, you have a bad attack of Roman fever, which all Anglo-Catholic boys have had. Yeah. Um, uh, but you, in fact, poked under the influence of a man with the astonishing name of Father Dazzle. Father Dazzle, yeah. yes. <laughs> I did. He, he was a Roman Catholic. Tell us about that. And he was a complex figure himself. He was a very, anyone who knew, his name was Derek Jennings, known universally as Dazzle, because he did dazzle. He thought, my Spanish chasuble glittered, you should have seen <laughs> his. But Dazzle was a former Anglican who had converted. He was a very waspish, irascible, difficult, but very funny person. And there's, he just used to, he didn't realize how funny he was sometimes. <laughs> he was very camp. And uh, he didn't realize he was very camp, although I have to say the rest of the world had kind of picked up on that. <laughs> but, uh, there was one bit I remember where it was at some big do at Westminster Abbey, and he was there as chaplain to the Archbishop of Westminster, the Roman Catholic Archbishop. And there was a big procession out with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and then the Archbishop of Westminster, and then there was another Anglican bishop, notoriously flamboyant too, I won't say any names. But I remember oh, I was in the... Oh, come on. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
if I were to say Fulham, shall we leave it there? Oh, yes. But, um, mm -hmm. but as Dazzle went past, he was in his cassock and his cotter and his hands together like that. And as he, he passed me in a pew and he looked at me, he looked at the bishop and just went, she's mad. <laughs> <laughs> So he could be very solemn and very proper, and then all of a sudden it was Julian and Sandy. He was a, I mean, I, I, that makes him sound like a caricature, and he was much, much more than that. He was a very interesting, thoughtful, challenging, difficult person, mm. and really good for me. So we became good friends, and then I became a Roman Catholic under his instruction, and did 10 years as a Roman Catholic. And thought of becoming a monk? Yes, I, I had a very continue to have a very sort of strong relationship with the monastic community mm -hmm. and um, you only got to put me in a monastery for five minutes and I think I could be, this is my natural habitat, I think you probably share yeah, that Richard, yeah, you know that yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but I was by then I mean I think in a way being a Roman Catholic taught me that I was Church of England, it, I needed to be a Roman Catholic to understand that I was Church of England yeah. and I missed the hymns Yeah, I know missing the hymns is more than a sing song. It's yeah. missing the whole yeah. culture of the yeah. church. Yeah. It's theology. It's yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. And you have to do it. You're told. Well, of course, I had Dazzle as an example who <laughs> could who could give the appearance of doing what he was told ah. while doing exactly yeah. what he yeah. wanted. But yeah. Uh, yeah. but I, but I, I sort of found my way back into the. I mean, I think perhaps it was also a complicated avoidance strategy for not acting on what was becoming more and more obvious was that I was being called to ordained ministry. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to be in ordained ministry. So I did try very hard for 10 years not to get ordained. But you came back, you came back into the Church of England, and then uh, you became an ordinand, yeah. um, and you went to a seminary called Murfield. Yeah. Um, now, the seminary I went to, we always thought of Murfield as a sort of holiday camp. Um, <coughs> Uh, we had cold showers every day to suppress the libido. You didn't suppress libido in Murfield, from what I can <laughs> read here. <so. laughs> well, I suppose it's one of those curious situations that a sort of Anglican monastic theological college um, produces intense, intense uh, sexual libido because of the sheer unavailability of its uh, quietus, I, I suppose know. you might say. Um, torment! Torment. Yeah. <laughs> but there's something about that, isn't there? And it could have put a lot of young men together living ostensibly celibate lives can sometimes be... You said you hadn't encountered evil till you went to Murfield. Well, I was slightly tongue in cheek. Someone once asked me, what did you learn at Murfield? And I said, I didn't really believe in the reality of evil until I went to theological what college. What do you mean by that? Well, I wasn't talking about moral theology. I think mm. what I was talking about is what you discover in monastic communities, mm. in theological colleges, mm. in, if I may say so, cathedral communities too, yeah. that is where the light burns brightest, yeah. darker shadows are cast. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something, and what's Christi Christianity in this life is the effort of people in their imperfection called to the perfection of God. Mm. And what's interesting about what we do and what's awful about what we do happens in the gap between those two things. Yeah. And it happens yeah. most intensely and vividly in places where people are seriously trying to do that. And you know, this idea that a, mon a monastery is somewhere where you go and uh, people serenely float around full of the love of the Lord Jesus. It's, not a, it's a laboratory for the reality of being human. Mm. And that is a place of darkness and competitiveness and rivalry and contention and sometimes murderous impulses. I remember the uh, superior of the community at Murfield, Father George, saying, if ever there was a murder in the monastery, there'd be 50 suspects. <laughs> 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 but also, he said something else that was very good. He was a man of few words, but they told. And when I was talking to him once, I was talking about you know, the toughness of living a monastic life, the burden it placed on you for the you know, undodgeable facts of yourself. Mm. And he said, mm, dig where the shit is. Yeah. <laughs> and that is actually mm. profoundly mm. Uh, meaningful advice. Isn't it? You were ordained and you did a curacy in Boston. That's right. Yeah. Links, not Mass. Boston. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> not Boston, Boston. That's Boston, right. yeah. Yeah, 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 Boston, yeah, Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, then uh, after that, where? Well, I, I worked in, in, in Boston, which is a little town on the edge of England, 35 miles of cabbages on one side, 35 miles of the wash on the other side, mm -hmm. an intense social problem. a huge problem with heroin, a huge problem with social exclusion. So it's very odd being in what looked like a a kind of very traditional English town, but with these real problems. And then I was called to the gritty inner city, and I took a post as 
senior curate at St. Paul's Knightsbridge, SW1. <laughs> Well, someone has to do it. <laughs> to give you an idea about what it was, what it was like, I remember on, the, on my first... I'd looked after the, the children and a school when I was in Boston, and that had mostly meant getting the children out of custody of one kind or another. Um, they, it was tough, tough lives they lived. And I got a school in my new parish in Knightsbridge, and I went along on my first day to the school. <laughs> and whereas the schools in Boston had been quite tough places, this was sort of impeccable. It, children all looked like they were in the Bowdoin catalogue, you know. They, and I had to take a, a register of names, and I went along and I said, What's, and all the children were called Rupert and Tamara or something. <laughs> and I got to one little boy, he's about five years old, this kind of angelic-looking child, and I said, what's your name? And he went, Tinos. Oh, and then he went. So I wrote down Tinos, and I said, what's your surname? And he said, of Greece. Oh! <laughs> But it was, of course, an introduction to the bizarre range and variety and diversity yes. of the Church of England. So I then had another three years working in probably the richest neighbourhood in the richest city in the world, mm -hmm. asking myself, what's the point of Christian ministry here? And the answer is, well, all the usual things, of course, mm -hmm. hatching, matching, dispatching, offering worship and praise and so forth. But really, it's trying to get very rich people to think about how they could use that wealth, that surplus, creatively. Mm. Quite a challenge, I have Absolutely. to say. Absolutely. But it was good. Um, And then to, to um, find, and I want to um, uh, bring the BBC in here, because you've always been a, a brilliant natural broadcaster, um, oh, and, you, and you still are. <laughs> um, and uh, you love the Church of England and the BBC with equal passion. Uh, neither is an institution that's popular with the current Westminster government. Um, can you offer us a reflection on how you see the future of both of those great um, institutions? Because they're kind of shaking a bit at the moment, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I think it is never a surprise that the Church of England and the BBC should not be beloved by whoever's in power. Mm -hmm. And of course, a reminder when people think the BBC is a sort of nest of unreconstructed leftists, just to remember how much Tony Blair's administration hated the BBC mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And I think if the government hates the BBC, that means the BBC is probably doing its job. I think the C of E also in the great days of the 1980s, where was the real opposition to that kind of hard-faced market ideology of Thatcherism? Mm -hmm. Well, faith in the city, the report of the Church of England into what was happening in the inner city was a hugely significant rallying point mm -hmm. for opposition. I think some of the fire has gone from our belly, that would be an understatement. Um, and I think the Church of England's place, an honorable place uh, in the mainstream of things is looking more fragile than it has done before. I think the BBC's place in the mainstream is looking more fragile because the economics of broadcasting have changed so much, and also because it is surrounded by um, hostile, hungry, powerful rivals. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose a pessimist might think that, I should say, when I had my um, selection, when I went to ordination, a selection conference, which is when you're, as you know, put through a series of tests to see if you're suitable for ordained ministry. Um, my senior selector was the Archdeacon of Lindisfarne. Aren't you glad there's a church that has an Archdeacon yeah. of Lindisfarne? Yeah. And he looked at me and looked at my file. I'd been working for the BBC for 10 years by now. And he said to me, why does somebody like you want to get mixed up with a broken down, failing institution that's lost any sense of its tradition and doesn't know where it's going. <laughs> and I said, I'm thinking of leaving the BBC. <laughs> 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 and you know, it is everyone, I, I once yeah. did a documentary about, about Radio 3. Mm. And it's interesting, whenever you spoke to somebody who'd worked for Radio 3, they said, oh, it was the best place to work in the world. And then after I left, it went to the dogs. Yeah. So I think everyone who works there, because mm. you love it, mm -hmm. and it's, you shouldn't really love institutions because they don't love you back. And if you're a church person or a BBC person, mm. you mm. temper your love for an institution by a pragmatic sense of how institutions work. But I do think... I'm very conscious also that in Scotland, of course, the performance of the BBC is very differently experienced from in England too. And I wouldn't want to pretend that I'm really expert or able to speak to that particularly. But I do think within the culture of certainly England, and I would hope Britain, the BBC has played an honourable part. And I do think also, if we lose it, we'll wake up and think, how the hell oh, did we God, let that yeah. happen? Yeah. As yeah. for the C of E, um, 
I think there are lots of things about the CFV and the challenges it faces at the moment that are not entirely bad. I think if we were to fall out of love with the organs and institutions of power, mm -hmm. that wouldn't hurt us so very much. And I would like to think that the sort of broad, liberal, ironic, uh, palate, putty palated CFV that I feel I'm part of now uh, might continue to hold a place in our national life and in the affections of people. I suspect it will. Um, a final cheeky question. Um, were you always a Richard Richard, ever a dick? <laughs> <laughs> How to answer that? I, I mean, I, yeah. I, um, I, I, well, I'm, funnily enough, um, it depends who you talk to. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm Richard to most of the people I work with. Yeah. M my oldest friends tend to call me Rich because that's what I was when I was then. Um, my family, interestingly, call me Tricky. <laughs> well, that normally goes with, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> So you've never been a dick. Uh, <laughs> it's not really for me to say. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and yeah. if you follow Twitter, you'll yeah. see that there's a considerable body of evidence in support yes. of the opposite view. Yes, I've been a dick to thousands. So let's, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's move to your enthralled audience. There are a couple of mics, and we've got about... Oh, we'll just ignore the time, really. But we've got a couple <laughs> of mics, um, and we'll start over here. Who wants to go first? Um, yep, yeah, there we are. And, yeah, thank you. Hello, Richard. No? Um, I'm an elder in the Church of Scotland, and some of our more fervently conservative ministers and congregations have fallen out lately over the question of ordained people who are also not heterosexual. What do you say if people come to you and challenge you that you can't be both a Christian minister and a gay man? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I mean, the, you know, the short answer is, of course you can. The, uh, the slightly longer answer is, and thus it ever was. And then the more complex answer is, what do we make of it? Now, at the moment, the church, which tends to naturally be in some ways a conservative organisation, in other ways a radical organisation, finds itself being particularly conservative around sexuality for all sorts of complex reasons. For the Church of England, it's particularly interesting because as an established church, then we have a particular relationship to our national life as enshrined in the laws of the land, and those have changed significantly in the past 10 years. So we're in an interesting place about how fit are we to catch up with that reality, while, the same, while it's maintaining the sense that we're true to our traditions and yet alert for the signs of God's new creation, to use slightly jargonized language. I mean, I'm hopeful about this because I think the experience has been in the wider world that um, gay people, and not just gay people, but I think LGBTQIA, however long you want to extend that list, people who don't conform to the sort of uh, norm, established norm, um, have had a pretty raw deal of it, actually, and bring a wealth of experience, which I think will greatly enrich our life as, enriches our life as a community, and will enrich our lives as churches, too. But we've got a long way to go before we get there, and I wouldn't want to pretend that that's going to be the work of a moment, and I suspect it'll get nastier before it gets mm. nicer. But I think, in the end, truth is great and will prevail. And my, I mean, I, I'm a vicar of a parish. I have a same-sex partner. We're in a civil partnership. He's also ordained. We're in the most Middle English parish you can imagine. Most of my parishioners read the Daily Mail, pretend they don't, but I know they do. <laughs> <laughs> and yet nobody bats an eyelid. They've just become completely used to having uh, partnered same-sex. Um, also, they get two clergy for the price of one. So, you know, it kind of works. Anyone else? Yeah? Yeah. Anyone this side? Uh, anyone in the middle here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyone over here? Yeah, 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 there we go. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I wondered if, if you could explain whether the difference between the Roman Catholic Church, your experience of it, and the um, Anglican Church was one more of theology or a, a social construct. That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think uh, the reason I became a Roman Catholic, the Roman fever that you spoke of, Richard, is because there's something about the rigor and the system of the Roman Catholic Church, which I think if you're interested in that kind of stuff, does become sort of irresistible. And so 
if you want clarity and if you want something to uh, get through the frustrations that you often feel with Anglican uh, fuzziness and incompleteness, then the Roman system is very appealing. Uh, it's a bit like getting in a Ferrari after you've been driving a banger. Um, but then what I discovered was, of course, that's not what your commitment to a church is necessarily all about. Mine was to a culture, and that culture was not one that was really shared fully in the Roman Catholic Church, because I was formed in the Church of England, I was formed in its choral tradition, and I did miss the hymns, but I don't just mean that I couldn't sing along. And also, Roman Catholic hymns in the parish, not perhaps up there, anyway, don't go on. anyway um, <laughs> there's a great richness of the Anglican uh, choral tradition, and it was a place in which I found myself at home, theologically, culturally, ecclesiologically, all kinds of ways. And the things that used to most annoy me about the Church of England, precisely its fuzziness, its incompleteness, its reluctance to be dogmatic or too propositional, are the things which now make it a place where I can breathe and be and make my mistakes without causing, I hope, too much damage to myself or others. Can I ask um, a question, Richard, about the crisis that came before the gay crisis, which was about the ordination of women. Um, uh, that was a long rumbling crisis in the Anglican church, as you know. Um, and the th one of the things that distressed me, I'd worked in the States for a bit, and in the States, the gay community was solidly behind the movement for the ordination of women, solidarity with another oppressed group. That didn't happen in the Church of England, in, in the great kind of Anglo-Catholic centers in London, yeah. uh, most of them were opposed to the ordination of women, and that profoundly saddened me. What, what was that about? I mean, there's a big division about <coughs> it. If you were someone like me in the um, uh, Anglo-Catholic quarters that were in favor of women's ordination, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, of course, that just made perfect sense. And it would seem to me that anyone who was interested in incarnational ministry, how they could not get the arguments in favor of women's ordination was baffling to me. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, there's a huge uh, conservative center also in Anglo-Catholic, in the Church of England in its Anglo-Catholic circles, which was, I think, very much opposed to women's ordination for all sorts of reasons. I mean, the reasons that would be offered for inspection were to do with the church not being legitimate to act unilaterally over such a significant matter as who it ordains. We've all heard these mm -hmm. arguments. Mm -hmm. If I'm honest, and it's uncomfortable to admit, I think a great many people really were just very uncomfortable about women generally. Uh. And the thought of women in authority was something that was particularly uh, <laughs> difficult. And I know that from, I think that's, I, I just think there was a deep tinge of misogyny to it, and continues to be a deep tinge of misogyny to it. No, not entirely, not exclusively. These things are always complex and don't readily break down into easily caricaturable positions. Mm. But I think the, and I think a lot of that was to do with a clerical culture, which was about providing a refuge for gay people. Uh, gay is perhaps the wrong word for people who would describe themselves as homosexual, um, mm. who had not really fully explored the psychology of that, and had not really explored what that might mean for them in a life lived beyond themselves and their coterie. Mm. And I think where you get those coteries, and it's often it's a, I don't want to be entirely dismissive or unkind or ungenerous mm. about it, often those were coteries that existed to defend people in a hostile world. But I think it also makes those coteries resistant to change in, in lots of ways. Mm. I'm painting in very broad brushstrokes here. Mm. But I think in America also, my sense is that the Episcopal Church in the United States had a very close relationship to the civil rights movement in yeah. particular yeah. in the 1960s, around mm. the time of Martin Luther King. Mm. Uh, and I think that... They saw it as a, a unity. Yeah, yeah. which I mm. would have been the... I mean, I think in a way that you were saved for Anglicanism by having the experience of going to America and experience mm. the Episcopal mm. Church of the United States. Yeah. I'm telling you what you think. We yeah. should do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions yet? <clears throat> I can't see it. There's one up there. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. there, there, there. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. This is maybe a little bit pink and fluffy, but I was just wondering if you have a favourite and or least favourite hymn. Oh, what a treat. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <coughs> um, gosh, I have, I think, uh, I, I'd spend large chunks of my time planning my funeral, um, <laughs> which at the moment, with a ring cycle, is running to about 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but there's a, there's a hymn I, I love. It's a very, a very Anglican hymn, which is Oh, Praise Ye the Lord, to the tune Laudate Domino. Oh, Praise Ye the Lord, by Parry, one of the great uh, composers mm-hmm. of that period. Also, mm-hmm. did you know, killed by the feminist movement? Parry was a great supporter of women's suffrage and went oh. to a rally in the Albert Hall oh. in 1918 in that cause and caught flu and died. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> He died a martyr. Friendly fire, <laughs> yes, you might say. <laughs> and as for ones I loathe, oh gosh, there's one that we get an awful lot, which is, um, it's for musical reasons. The sentiments I find entirely wholesome, but it's brother, sister, let me serve you. There's a bit of the last time where it goes, dee da dee da 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 <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not keen on that one particularly. I would very happily never, ever, ever sing All Things Bright and Beautiful again. <laughs> it's got that lovely phrase, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. Yeah. God made them high or lowly and ordered their estate. So God's a Tory. Well, it's... A <laughs> <laughs> but it's a... I mean, an interesting reality, the Church of England was around that. Of course, that verse has been yeah. removed from mm. modern editions. Has that, it? Yeah. They, ah. yeah that, that verse is now erased. Oh, I see. Like Beria in oh. photographs in the Stalinist yeah. era, it's gone. <laughs> um, but but uh, it was, of course, a reflection of the time when the Church of England was very much the Tory party at prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Well, it ain't that now, no. I think it would be fair to say. Nope. Although there are, I mean, there's a piece on the wireless this morning with Quentin Letts talking about the Book of Common Prayer. I don't know if you heard it. But, uh, you know, obviously there are huge traditions in the Church of England where I think people who are of a conservative political and cultural temperature would, would find themselves at home. And I'm all for that. I don't want a church. Yeah. I don't want the Church of England to be like reading The Guardian, a sort of affirmation of everything I think. Uh, I, I want it to be something... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say that the point of a church is that it is bigger than you and that it should be a place of real challenge because then you might just break something, yeah. crack something, mm. learn something, change, develop. You know. mm. That's a wonderful thing about being part of the church. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it is a wonderful thing about being part of the Church of England. There are other things which aren't so great. Mm. <laughs> I, had a, I had a church warden in Boston um, who is a Massachusetts, not Lincoln. Ma- Massachusetts. <laughs> and he's, he said, the great thing about being an Anglican is it doesn't interfere with your politics or your religion. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> Any more questions? Yep, 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 yeah, they're all coming now. Yep, yep. Can I ask what your views are on the disestablishment of the Church of England and the possibly of the position of bishops in the House of Lords? Well... My Lord. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I have mixed views about it, I think. I mean, I, th- I think if I were just to stand back from it, the idea, I mean, the, the arguments in favour of the establishment of the Church of England just seem to me to be so difficult to stand up, so rickety, that I wouldn't want to have to try to defend them. On the other hand, there's something to be said for the givenness of the church. There's something to be said, I find, that I am the parish, I'm the vicar of Findon, I'm the bloke who wears this, I work at the building with the pointy roof in the middle. And people just know that. And you don't need to have, uh, you know, make some kind of huge effort of uh, creedal acrobatics. or You could just come and we're just there. There's a givenness about that. And I think that's probably related to the sort of givenness which has also bishops in the House of Lords. I think also, and this is the big change for me, I was very much um, of Republican views and sympathies. Since I've been ordained and been a vicar of the Church of England, I am no longer. Not merely because I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me, um, but actually because I've come to see that there are certain merits to the way the establishment works, particularly the monarchy, actually. I can't believe I would never have thought these words would fall from my lips. But the idea for sort of having a head of state um, who is not a party political figure is something that seems to me to have great merit. But also, I think the way it enables people to relate to history through a person. I think that is a very powerful idea. Now, these are slightly anecdotal sorts of um, points I'm making, not sufficient to answer the rigor, the rigorous questioning about how, in a democracy, a situation of establishment can endure. So I think if I had to vote on it, I would probably vote for it to go. But I might 
at the same time have some concerns about what passes as it does go. That's so Church of England, isn't it? <laughs> but I think it's very hard to see it enduring much longer. Yeah. Anyone else up here? Before we move oh, up there? Yep, yep, yep. Sorry. You're earning your keep tonight, sprinting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Is Anne Close here, by the way? Anne Close? Yeah. Well, your son says hello. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in an idle minute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, as I suspect you may not get the chance to answer this question on radio, what would your inheritance tracks be? Sorry, what would? Your inheritance tracks oh, be. Oh, gosh. Well, the bliss. Thank you, sir. Um, the other thing I do when I'm not planning my funeral is plan my desert island discs too. But you're not allowed, as a, as a reigning Radio 4 presenter, to do desert island discs. It's the one consolation of being fired, is you can. But for my inheritance tracks, I think the piece of music that I would most value that was passed on to me, gosh, it would probably be the New English hymnal, all of it. So every hymn in the New England, the Green Hymn Book. And what I would pass on to other people, I think it would be XTC making plans for Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got time for one more question. There's an arm up there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Richard, can I ask you about marriage and whether you think uh, the churches, uh, England, Scotland and the Catholic Church, are a little behind general public feeling about whether gay people should be allowed to marry in the church, not civil unions, but actually marry... Uh, it seems to me that a lot of church people have a real problem with the yeah. definition of that yeah. word. I mean, I think that the church is behind, I, I'm not, I can't really qualify to speak about Scotland, but in England, I think uh, civil partnerships has had an enormous effect in changing people's attitudes. Because I think a lot of people, perhaps people who grew up in a world where homosexuality was seen as something clandestine and a bit unpleasant, all of a sudden realised that it was a slice of cake and a glass of Prosecco. Hurrah! <laughs> so, you know... <coughs> So people very quickly got, got used to same-sex couples being fine. Um, and I suspect that's the same wherever um, civil partnerships or, or same-sex marriage prevails. Our people get used to it pretty quickly. The, the issue for the churches, of course, is that we are accountable to one another across jurisdictions, nationalities, indeed continents. And the Anglican Communion, if you think that is a coherent body at all, big question, um, needs to account for itself across an enormous diversity of views. And if you were, for example, take the temperature of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, or some churches in sub-Saharan mm. Africa, not all of them, uh, or the southern cone, as we call it, you'd find people who are implacably opposed to homosexuality um, on grounds that it is simply inconsistent with the gospel and immoral. So we have a huge issue. How do we, as a church that might feel differently about that, seek to engineer changes to reflect that, while at the same time remaining in communion with other Christians who think very, very differently. Well, that's the story of the Anglican Communion at the moment. Some people have been particularly blooded, I would say, in that conflict, mm. not you not least, mm. Richard. Mm. And it is a, it's a really, really tough one. I would say in the darkest moments of that, that at least you know it's real. That if we are having those uh, incredibly difficult and uh, unedifying disputes within our, among ourselves, then at least this means that it's something important and valuable and that we're investing in it, I guess. And I do think in the end, all will be well and all manner of things shall be well. I said to my, that to my mother and she said, what's that from? And I said, Julian of Norwich. She said, isn't that a hair salon? <laughs> <laughs> That is a very appropriate moment to, to end. We've had an enthralling hour with this very lovable man. Please give him a big round of applause.